Okay, welcome to Run to the Hills, Countdown to the Spine with Stephen Brown. This is our second episode, and uh, it's now Sunday, the 1st of November. So the race now is 10 weeks away, Stephen. So I gather you're in a different home. You're, uh, you're at work this week in a different place, aren't you? So we're, we're zooming yeah. from, uh, from a hotel is that, or an apartment. Is that right? It's, a, it's an apartment in, in Newcastle. I'm up in Newcastle for a week, so I'm, I'm, I'm halfway to Kirk Yatam already. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we had some really nice feedback, Stephen, from the first episode. And thank you very much if you've watched it and uh, you've tuned in for the second one. I'll just read a couple of comments out. Um, Hannah Baisley said, that sounds like a great series. I'm fascinated by the spine race and love following it. Uh, will be a great insight into what is required by those who I see in all the, the spine update videos. And Di Wilson says... Thanks. This will be an interesting to watch and hear the preparations from such an experienced runner for such a well-known multi-day race. And he, he had a question for you, Stephen, and he says, right. is Stephen worried at all that the COVID restrictions may interfere with his preparations? So maybe we could start with that. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I'm not especially worried about them interfering with my preparations in the sense of my training because under sort of both lockdowns the previous one and the current lock uh, and the current lockdown um outside outdoor exercise has been allowed and I, and I tend to train by myself so it's not like I would be breaching any rules by meeting up with people um but the other element which I suspect um Dai was referring to in, in that question is um preparations for the race it you know the race itself and will covid restrictions affect the race itself i i suspect that they're going to have to in some way um there are five indoor checkpoints um and we all know that public spaces now are regulated in terms of social distancing um so but in terms of whether it worries me um i, I think what i'd say is i I have to, and all racers have to think through what the implications of that might be. I'm sure come the race, we will be told exactly what the, um, the requirements are. They haven't been published yet, but that's for, for very good reason because everything is a moving feast at the moment. Everything changes on a week by week basis. But I think for me, one of the big things I know um, today, the theme that we're going to talk about later on is sleep strategy. Um, and I've been given a lot of thought to well, what is my plan B if it turns out that I'm not allowed to or not able to sleep indoors at five warm checkpoints, because a large part of my race strategy does depend on doing that. Um, I can't take that for granted this time. So I think it's um, my responsibility for my race to think through, well, what is plan B in terms of, you know, a simple thing for me, um, maybe having a warmer sleeping bag than the one which is regulation um, in my drop bag, if not in my backpack, so that if I have to sleep outdoors, um, you know, if, if the checkpoints say, well, you can sleep here, but not indoors, you've got to sleep outdoors, for example, around the checkpoint, um, that's a possibility. I would like a much warmer sleeping bag than the one I've got because I will not get a good night's sleep um, in, a, in a minimum spec sleeping bag. So things like that, um, thinking, thinking through the, those elements of it. And I suppose an, another big one would be um, perhaps the medical team won't be able to do everything for you if it's simple foot care i think it's going to be our responsibility or we need to be prepared to make it our responsibility so watch some youtube videos read some books on um, basic foot care how, how you tape up your own feet um so that you can be completely self-sufficient for that so i think the and that that if you approach that from the right way i think that can actually be quite an exciting dynamic to the race in um that we're going to have to be more responsible for things like that but we do need to think through those things and certainly that's uh, one of the things i'm doing in my preparation yeah that's interesting and i think obviously we'll we'll come on to your sleep strategy and maybe we can look at it from the point of view of what plan a and also plan b and maybe we'll yeah. come on to that but before we do that stephen we said that each week we or each time we meet up we would have a little chat about how your training's going physically and mentally as you prepare yeah. for the race for the 
so we, we met three weeks ago. So tell us a little yeah. bit about how your training has been going over the last, the last three weeks. Okay. My physical training is unfortunately um, extremely hampered. I, I have been carrying a calf injury. Mm. Um, so the, the Monday after I last spoke to you, it felt better. And I decided to go out for um, a 30 minute timed run just to see how it held up. 20 minutes into that run, my calf really tightened up. I walked back home. Um, and since then, um, I've tried one more 30 minute run and exactly the same thing happened. So that is the totality of the running that I've been able to do in three weeks is basically 40 minutes running uh, on both occasions, um, ending up with a calf injury, which unfortunately now feels worse than it did three weeks ago. Um, that said, the, the, the one other... Well, the, the other things I've been able to do by way of physical training is I did get out um, the weekend before last and I did um, seven hours walking up in the, the peaks. Um, my calf felt absolutely fine walking, which, which I'm happy with because for me, running is not a big part at all of what I need to do for the, the spine. So if I can get out and do a six or seven hour walk and feel comfortable doing that, and it was really bad weather, so it felt like good training for the spine. Um, because I can't do the running, I, I've been trying to do um, sets of squats. It's the one thing I can think of to do to maybe build up a bit of um, leg muscle. But um, my, my, my training is hampered, but I'm trying not to worry too much about it because I, I've just got to try and nurse that calf back, back into to shape. It's interesting, Stephen, how something like uh, walking and running uses slightly different muscles. Yeah. And so therefore, you know, if you try and run, your calf's sore, but you can walk quite strongly with, without, without any injury. And it's even if you're running downhill and uphill, it uses different yeah. muscles, doesn't it? It's amazing just how your, your legs work, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it is. Um, but for a race like the spine, for me and for the vast majority of people outside of the top, 10 shall we say um running is a trivial skill to have for it um w walking and all of the other skills are much more much more important um skills and a lot you know lots of people will run quite a bit on day one and day two but nearly everybody ends up walking for the majority of this race so i i you know, and I think at a later point, we might, might talk about pacing strategy because of that realization. I no longer really think about or focus on, on, on the running side of it. I think more about what is a good walking strategy. Yeah. Um, so anyway, my, my physical training isn't, isn't great, but I'm not, I'm not letting it get me down too much. Okay. Well done. Now, one of the things we talked about after we'd, after we'd recorded the, the episode yeah. last time was that um, uh, you wanted to be a little bit responsible or accountable to your weight. And you told yeah. me that your weight was 12 stone, um, 10 pounds when we did the interview last time. And you asked me, could you ask me uh, live what, what your weight is now? And we try and keep a track of yeah. it. So I can see you smiling already. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there's something I massively regret asking you, <laughs> asking you to do with me. Um, um, do you know, here's a funny, um, true story. Um, about three or four days after I, I, I told you that way, I, I weighed myself. I was down 12 stone two and I thought, magic, I've, I've lost over half a stone um, in, in four days, which should have made me suspicious. I, I, and I weighed myself every morning. And for the next week, I was always 12, two, 12, three. And then I realized my scales were sitting on a bit uh, on like a <laughs> coin, which had fallen on the floor and it completely affected them. I moved this coin and I was back up to 12, eight, 12, nine. This morning when I weighed myself, I was 12 stone eight. Um, which is not as much progress over three weeks as I wanted. Um, I've lost two pounds. The, the, pro, the, the big downside of, for me about not being able to get out to run is not about the training value for the spine, but it would be my best way of losing weight. I find it very hard to lose weight if I'm not getting out and doing sort of intense bursts of exercise like that. So um, I have lost a bit of weight, but nowhere near the, the, um, at the, pace i would like to be losing the weight shall we say okay 
Well, be warned, I will be asking you again next time. <laughs> so we'll see what you are. Now, uh, as, as we said at the beginning, we wanted to do each episode to try and focus on one main thing uh, as yeah. a top tip, really, for those that are doing the race and for those that just love yeah. to follow it and see what's going on. And then we decided this time it would be about sleep strategy. So can yeah. you just outline your, what you've learned over the last five years of how to deal with the fact that this is a, for most people, it's at least six going into seven days uh, of continuous movement. And each time you yeah. stop, then the clock doesn't stop. You keep on, the clock keeps on going. So tell us what your overall strategy is, please. Um, the, the reason why I wanted to talk about this topic and thought it was an important topic to talk about is the sleep deprivation, the cumulative effect of sleep deprivation was the number one thing which surprised me the first time I did the spine. It was the thing I was least prepared for um, and, is le and is most difficult to prepare for. So my sleep strategy now is um, there are five indoor checkpoints. I know that I cannot and will not sleep, but the first of those, the first checkpoint is 42 miles in. Um, I will arrive there between 14 and 16 hours into the race, um, but I will be far too adrenalized and awake to sleep at it. So I, I, I no longer try and sleep at that checkpoint. That is um, meal, change of socks, sort out any kit and back out. Then the next four indoor checkpoints, my strategy is to try and get as much quality sleep as I can at indoor checkpoints. And I, um, I've, I've, I've not read the, I think there is a book about the Sky Racing Team, but I've, I've read articles about it. And I know one of the big philosophies they had, the Sky Cycling Team, was about these marginal gains. And one, one of the things I've, I read a newspaper article about was bringing their own pillows and they all had their own pillows to sleep on. Obviously, I'm not taking a pillow um, with me along, along the length of the spine, but simple um, things like uh, having comfortable clothes to sleep in. Um, I, I, I tend to sleep in boxer shorts at home. That's what I'm comfortable sleeping in. And so for the sake of having a pair of cotton boxer shorts in my, uh, in my drop bag so that when I'm sleeping in a checkpoint, I can sleep in what I'm used to sleeping in. Um, I always have um, a shower before I um, sleep in a checkpoint. So I feel clean and fresh before I do that. Um, you know, things you, you'll, people will read a lot about this on blogs, but things like um, uh, earplugs, the, there's a lot of snoring. I don't, act, personally, I don't actually find them very easy to sleep with earplugs, but I always do have them just in case, or an eye mask in case it's um, uh, not particularly dark in the room that you're sleeping in. Um, but you're trying, for me, I'm trying to maximize the, qu the quality of that sleep, make it deep sleep. Um, the first three years I did the spine, I always set an alarm on my phone and I would set that for a quantity of time, which was usually either two, three or four hours. Um, and I would usually add 10 to 15 minutes on to that to allow myself to get to sleep and then have two hours quality sleep before I woke up. Um, I, I can't say that I would advise this to other people, but what I, but now... I don't use an alarm at all. I've learned um, to simply trust that I will sleep for as long as I need to sleep. And if that means that I actually fall asleep and sleep for six and a half hours, then I'm happy to do that. I, that doesn't stress me out too much. The reality I have found is that I'm much more likely to sleep for 60 or 90 minutes and then wake up. But the, the benefit for me of not using an alarm is I have found if I go to bed, and I've got an alarm set for two hours, 15 minutes, and I lie there and I'm thinking about the race and I'm a little bit awake. I then begin to get really stressed thinking, oh, I bet you I've used more than 15 minutes already. I bet you I'm under two hours or I'll better check the time. I've only got one hour, 55 minutes left. I've not fallen asleep yet. And that mind process can, mm. can then actually, mm. I've, I've, I've lain in bed for two hours, 15 minutes awake, worrying about the fact that I'm exhausted and can't get to sleep. So I, I, I have found that not having an alarm, I just lie there and I drift off and I, I tend to wake up um, when my body tells me that I've, I've had enough sleep and that, 
that works for me. So that's number one part of my sleep strategy, maximum uh, quality sleep in warm checkpoints in a nice bed. I then inter Sorry, can you, sorry, can I just ask yeah. you one, one quick question on that point before yeah. you, you go on the next one? Yeah. And then um, that is, if, if, you're, if you arrive at a checkpoint, one of those base indoor ones that you want to sleep in at, say, uh, 10 in the morning, so it's yeah. light, and um, does that worry you that you might, you might lose, if you slept there for four hours, you're going to lose the four hours of daylight? Does that worry you? Uh, no, it doesn't. I know that some racers do um, uh, uh, take that into consideration and think it, you know, it's horses for courses. I'm only telling you my sleep mm. strategy, but I would rather, for me, it would be more important um, to get my two, three or four hours sleep in that checkpoint, in a bed, in a warm room with proper bedding. A lot of them even have proper bedding and a proper pillow than it would be to think well I, i'm tired but it's daylight so i'll push on and because from when when you're exhausted and this will happen to most racers at, at some point in the race honestly i've seen people and their moving pace drops to between one and a half and two miles an hour um that they're, they're, they're staggering along um and it's such an inefficient state to be in that f I would rather sleep, lose three or four hours daylight and, I, you know, and be fresh and carry on moving at my two and a half mile to three mile an hour pace that I know I can sustain in the dark or in the light uh, and be sort of as focused as I'm likely to be. So no, that, that, that's not a consideration for me, but it is, you know, if you're thinking through your own sleep strategy, that is maybe something you want to think about. Are you going to try and time it so that you arrive at checkpoints when it is dark so that you're not losing daylight as part of your sleep strategy? Okay. No, that's really interesting. And I, as you say, I think different people, I would imagine, would have different, different ideas, but it's good to get your yeah. experience on that. Okay, so that's your overall one. And then you're going to, you're going to explain a bit more about in between that, right? Yeah, obviously, um, for the spine, um, part of the compulsory kit is basically to take with you at all times a full sleeping kit, which is a um, minimum spec, uh, zero degree comfort rating sleeping bag, a full length sleeping mat and some sort of bivy bag, or if not a bivy bag, a shelter of some sort. And some people do take one man tents. Um, uh, I very, very rarely actually use any of that kit, but I do sleep in between checkpoints. So um, what I do is I intersperse my quality sleep at the checkpoints with what um, a, a German racer, uh, Michael Friends, taught me the phrase a ninja bivy. Um, he, he introduced that to me one year. And I, so I intersperse my quality sleep with a ninja bivy, which is when I literally, wherever I am, when the, the complete exhaustion comes on me, I will lie down and sleep for 10 to 15 minutes at the side of the trail. Um, I usually have um, some sort of ground sheet at the top of my backpack and a warm coat. And I throw the ground sheet down, put a warm coat on and just lie down and sleep. And I, I'm, I do that when I'm at that point where I'm beginning to fall asleep on my feet. And I find a 10 to 15 minute cat nap or ninja bivy um, brings me around, stops me being um, in, in that point where I'm sort of nodding off on my feet. And I, I usually gets me one to two hours of quality movement. And then I might have to do it again. Um, Certainly in the, the later stages of the race, I might be doing two or three ninja bivvies um, per, per leg or per section. Um, uh, but that, how, that, does that, the weather, how does the weather affect that, Stephen? If, um, you know, if it's snowing or raining, would you still do it? Um, I, I would do if I was sufficiently tired. If, I was, if, if it was raining heavily, I would probably find, try and find somewhere in the shelter of the trees. The, the mm. ground sheet that I take is something that if I needed, to, I've never had to do this, but if I needed to, um, I could sort of lie down on it and pull it over um, myself. I, I've done it in sort of pretty heavy snow before. I just kicked a hole in the snow, um, lay down in it. And mm. w w when, when you're that tired, all you can focus on or all I can focus on is the need for sleep. And you could sleep through pretty much um, anything in those circumstances. But it is, it's amazing how how much 
refreshment you can get from a very short um, bit of sleep. Um, I remember pa Pavel Polonsi, who's won the race three times, I think I remember um, watching some footage of him. He was going for a fastest known time on the Pennine Way outside of the race, but he was going for a fastest known time. And he got to somewhere around Malin Tarn and he, he said, oh, I'm, I'm really tired. I'm, I'm going to lie down and have a sleep. I want you to wake me up in two minutes. And literally what he was going to have was a two minute sleep. And, and, that, and that was long enough. And I've never done one quite that short. But, you know, for him, a very, very experienced guy who, who knows how to handle sleep exhaustion, he knew that a two-minute sleep would be enough to give him another burst of energy to carry on for a bit. I've heard of some stories of support crews saying, you know, the runner saying, I, I, want, I want an hour or 50 minutes or whatever. Yeah. And they've, uh, they've laid them down. And then they've woke them up 10 minutes later and said, right, you've had an hour. <laughs> and okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Mark Caldwell did that to me really? in hot, hot one in the TV. It's the first year I did the race. I said, I've got to have 40 minutes. I've got to have 40 minutes. And he woke me up after about 15. He said, right, your 40 minutes is up. You need to get back out again. I looked at my watch. I knew he was lying to me, but <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew he had my sort of my best interests at heart. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that's great. So that overall strategy then is to sleep a quality sleep in the in the checkpoint in the indoor checkpoints, yeah. and then your ninja ones in between those, depending on how many yeah. you need. But yeah. it seems to me that what you're saying, Stephen, is that the criteria is that you want to be fresh enough to still be moving at two and a half miles an hour, whereas. Yeah. If you're exhausted, as you said, you've seen other people who are basically staggering at one and a half miles an hour because they really yeah. need to sleep. So you want to avoid getting to that point where you are hardly moving. I, w I want to avoid it for two reasons. One, it's an incredibly inefficient state to be in mm. um, or movement. Um, but secondly, it, it is completely miserable. I, I, I absolutely hate being in that state where all mm. I can think about is sleep. Um, in the first year I did the race, I nearly um, DNF'd before checkpoint three because I was so exhausted. I just I decided that there was no way I could carry on. Luckily for me, I then had one of the best two hour sleeps I've ever had in a race at that next checkpoint and woke up feeling completely refreshed. And that was what a big learning point for me about how you can feel like your race is over and a relatively short uh, piece of sleep can actually turn it right round for you. Um, but yeah, I, so I, I try and avoid um, another phrase Michael had as well as Ninja Bivy was um, zombie walking. That's how he described it when people get like that. Um, it, it's very inefficient from a pacing point of view and it's utterly miserable from a mental point of view. So mm. th there's two good reasons to try and avoid it. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. And I think that um, that's going to really help people and give people an appreciation of uh, what it involves. But I think this whole the whole thing about sleep it is a big factor. I know when we when we talked before, Stephen, is that you feel that is one of the things that you have been good at, <laughs> you know, in the sense of really getting on top of that, and that's been a help to you. So there might be runners who are quicker than you, but you tend to do better because you can handle that sleep better. I, I usually leave checkpoint one somewhere between 65th and 80th position in the race. And I've usually finished somewhere between um, 25th and 30th overall in the, uh, in, in the race. And believe me, when it's a multi-day race, it's much more pleasant to start off mm -hmm. near the back and watch yourself moving up the field than yeah. it is to start off near the front and watch yourself slipping back <laughs> down, the, down the field. Yeah. Uh, and most, most of that is just to do with um, efficient checkpoint strategy, which is another topic um, we'll maybe talk about another week, uh, and efficient sleep strategy, all to try and maintain a nice even pacing strategy. Yeah, excellent. And we will, we'll come on to those. I'd love to get your thoughts on those as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, the other thing we said we would do at the end of each episode, Stephen, is just to, yeah. to, to see where you're at on a scale of one to 10 on yeah. both mentally and physically. So last time on the physical side, you said that you were a two and a half out of 10. And we did have a comment on the, on one of the Facebook groups saying that they were surprised that you said that. And I think yeah. I think you thought it was even, it should have been lower, <laughs> but he, he was thinking yeah. you should have been higher, I, I think. Thought I thought yeah. I told you two, but there you go. Well, I've written down two and a half, yeah. Right. 
yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to bump myself up a notch then to, th to three out of ten, but I've, I've told... I, I did get the impression from one of the comments I read that somebody just thought I was being sort of maybe falsely modest or trying to play mind games with that. And, and I've told you how little training I've been able to do over the last um, three weeks. And that, that, that is honest. I, I've had two abortive runs and a, a nice long day out in the hills and a few um, squats I've been doing um, at home. But um, I, I'm, I'm going to put myself up to three because I have begun slowly to take control of the weight thing or br bring it down a bit. And I feel like I'm doing what I can um, to, to try and sort of get some exercise in without further injuring myself. Okay, well done. And mentally, mentally, you said that you were seven and a half out of 10 on the mental preparation. So has that moved up at all? Uh, yeah, I'm going to put myself at an 8 out of 10 because the race is getting closer. I'm feeling more excited about it. I've begun to think through, you know, some of the things we we're talking about is, you know, what what is my plan B for checkpoint strategy? What is my plan B for, for sleep strategy um, this year? So the fact that I've begun to think about those things, I haven't, I, I, I'm not going to say that I've yet got very firm plans for any of them, but I've begun to think about what it might look like for me mm if if the the checkpoints are no longer indoors or you know you're only allowed to be indoors for half an hour or something like that i've begun to think through how i will cope with that so i'm feeling more positive about it because you know i've started that process and we're getting closer yeah excellent and i think that will be quite a, a, a different race won't it if you're not allowed to sleep for three or four hours inside and you have to sleep outside and yeah, yeah. please like nobody mishear me um yeah. th that's not been announced yet and I, no. I i definitely don't have any inside track on this nobody's sort of telling me um secret information i don't know i'm just trying to think through every conceit you know what is a mm. worst case scenario of the race goes ahead, but what would be the worst case scenario at the checkpoints? And I suppose the worst case scenario would be if the checkpoints were, you know, not indoors or, or you were only allowed indoors for a very short period of time. So that, that's what I'm trying to um, think through. And yes, it will make the race very different if it's um, any restrictions like that. Yeah. Well, uh, th thank you once again, Stephen. And uh, it's been yeah. really interesting just to get your thoughts on sleep strategy and get an idea of where you're at at the moment. So we wish you all the best for this week at work, whatever uh, you've got on. And we'll yeah. meet again, hopefully in a couple of weeks time. And we'll think about another topic that we can share with those that uh, love this, love this race. So thank yeah. you very much. Yeah.